UFC 188 on pay-per-view this weekend. Sorry to be exact. In Mexico City Arena. In Mexico City, Federal District of Mexico. It's a bit of a mouthful. And a lot of Mexico. Um, this is a very weird card in the sense that there are 12 fights on the card. I honestly don't give a damn about nine of them. Eight of them for sure. There's one here on the other card that I'm intrigued to see, but we'll get to that. But the top three fight fights on the card are are, are such fights of, of, of considerable importance and caring importance that a video is is required just on those three fights. So what I'm gonna do is this video winds up going really short because as stated the previous nine the nine fights leading up to that will be kind of short because I don't really care. Um I may do a little thoughts about the Reebok deal and some other things going on. Um, Andrew Todd Hunter versus Albert Tumnov. Very interested to see the results of this fight. It's a non-pick for me. Reason being is that Todd Hunter is a really late replacement. And normally I'd still go with the late replacement, but this is such a different... Th this fight takes on such a, a tremendous different vibe than what was a pretty easy fight for Tumnov coming into it. And my question is, how serious was Tumnov taking the fight? How much can he adjust his preparation to prepare for a new and very dangerous fighter? And in, in that regard, those two questions make this just a complete non-pick. I, I would not put money on it. I would not go there. I'm interested to see it. Uh, G Gabriel Benavides, uh, Benitez versus Clay Collard. Uh, don't care. Kind of exciting fight. Clay Collard to win. Cathal Pendral versus Pendridge versus uh, Augusta Montano. Uh, Cathal to win. Uh, again, a fight I don't really care about. Um, yeah, well, I feel just being like slightly better everywhere. But um, um, just a side note, Cathal's a fighter who's come out recently against the Joe Rogan bias commentary, which is totally true. Um, anyone who's ever watched Joe Rogan commentary knows that Joe Rogan, he, he plays his favorites. Let's, let's not in any way confuse ourselves on that regard. He sells fighters that he likes very highly, uh, it doesn't make things up by any means, but the language he uses to describe things definitely leads you to believe. Like, watch some fights with Joe Rogan's commentary and you're under a complete pressure of who won the fight. Watch it without that commentary, and your opinion will sometimes change on, on fights, which to me is, is the weakness of Joe Rogan as a commentary. Uh, commentary. I like Joe Rogan as a commentary, but you have, to, you have to develop a way of going, okay, these are the things that Joe Rogan really, really loves. This fighter has those things. So, let us assume that he's going to paint him in the nicest picture possible. For example, anyone who uses rubber guard, don't trust Rogan's opinion on <laughs> Moving on. Francisco Trevino, Johnny Case. Interesting in that Trevino is the undefeated fighter, yet the one I have really no, no hype for, no, no, no high opinion of, no anything. Um, Johnny Case by decision. Patrick Williams versus Alejandro Perez. I don't even remember this being on the card. Go Patrick Williams, because he does seem like a really promising athlete if he can get some of the technical aspects of the game down. Efren Escudero, Drew Dober. Escudero is a complete Gitka guy I can't trust. Point blank. He has failed to beat anyone not very low on the food chain. I mean, his biggest win, uh, to be honest, probably since winning the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, well, I'm giving that. All right. Since his since his de hype uh, deflating hype losses to Evan Dunn and Charles Oliveira, let's put it that way. His first cut from the UFC, his biggest win since has been a couple of tough rejects and Jeremy Larson and Mike Rio, um, Luis Palomino. Yeah, that's that's really bad. Um. I don't think highly of Drew Dover's skills. I, I really don't. The most interesting thing about him is that he's dating Nick Hines' sister after Nick Hines beat him. Um, uh, he beat a, a shot Jamie Varner. Lost to Sean Spencer. Man, this, this fight sucks. Um... <clears throat> Dover, because I believe Escudero's like kind of almost mentally checked out of the game. We'll go with Dover by decision, but that, that's an ugly fight. Uh, Henry Cejudo versus Chico Camus. This should be a care fight, because Henry Cejudo's at that point where we should be getting fights that we care about. 
Problem is we don't. Um, this seems almost like a this seems like a step down in competition form. Like if I were to list the three opponents that uh, Cejudo fought: Dustin Kimura, uh, Chris Carriasso, and Chico Camus. Camus is like the lowest of that list. I mean, Kimura is a, a legitimate prospect who I think has a win over Camus. I'm not tremendously. Yeah, he beat Camus. He's two, you know, he's two and three in the UFC, so that's less than impressive. But you know, he beat Chico Camus, and then Chris Carriasso's one fight removed from a title fight. Yeah, this is it's weird matchmaking and and stupid. Uh, Cejudo, if he makes weight, etc., is in good shape. Points this fight. Tisha Torres, Angela Hill is a non-pick. Um, and the way I say this, Angela Hill is a fantastic athlete who's very, very young in her mixed martial arts career. And, of course, female MMA is largely about athleticism at this point, not about technique. Because even if you look at, like, okay, not to pick at Ronda Rousey here, but when you look at Ronda Rousey's skill sets, until relatively recently, she was the champion in the UFC who had by far the most minimal MMA skill set, one of the better grappling champions, but if you looked at the sum total of her game, it was very unimpressive, and it's only recently that we're, and she was dominant, like, that's the thing, is, like, we've had men come along with definitively not well-rounded game sets and win titles, um, I'm trying to think about, I can think of a number of number one contenders, but I'm having a hard time thinking of the most recent, like, champion. Uh, excluding the ever, you know, debaclish heavyweight division, which is painful because right there, you just go back to Brock Lesnar. Um, that's not a Lesnar dig. That's just a statement that Lesnar's skill set was not very well rounded. Um, I mean, we get Chel Sonnen for looking at title contenders. Champions, champions, champions. You have to go really far back. Again, like I said, Rousey's, specifically the Rousey stand up game has gotten so much better, but that's. That again, it points to a level of athletes and a level of unestablished technical fighters that we have because female MMA is so new that an athlete can make random jumps in the game. Like, not random, but very large jumps between fights. And it's been a while since we saw Angela Hill fight. I mean, her last fight, and only the second of her career was against Emily Kagan. Yeah, December 12th, 2014. So she's had six months. I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to get. Um, is the thing. I, I, I seriously don't know what fighter we're going to get. It's going to be better than we saw. And that's why this is a no pick. Um, and it's also why this is a fight is a no care because the thing is, is that, okay, T this is a fight that if we go with like TC Torres last fight and Angela Hill last fight, it's an easy, easy fight for Torres, but it's a very dangerous fight. But at the same time, it's not going to do anything for her if she wins. It's not going to move her closer to a title fight. And if she loses, it's going to be a massive swell down unless Angela Hill promptly goes on a complete tear. Um, yeah. Actually, the more I'm thinking about this, the more I'm thinking about Tisha Torres versus Ronda Marcos and how much I think Angela Hill could probably implement Marcos's game to a greater effect. No pick. Uh, Charles Rosa versus Yair Rodriguez. Uh, Rosa by submission. I care about Rosa. I don't give a damn about Rodriguez. Like this, this is a recurring theme on this card. Is that I? I care about specific fighters in the fight, but not the fight itself. Uh, Kelvin Gastelum, Nate Marquardt. Uh, going with Gastelum by decision. Faster. Marquardt's ability against people who are perceivably better athletes than him is is really going downhill. I mean, he's he's getting to the a an age in his career. The threat that Gastelum was going to have a problem with a much larger middleweight was kind of completely eliminated here by the fact that Marquardt, well, he is the bigger fighter, is not very good at any way actually applying his size advantage on people. Um, I mean, if you look... We look at the Mark Hart history here, specifically the recent one. Um, James Tahuna, he didn't apply his size against his speed. Um, Brad Tavares, he had problems with. Hector Lombard, he got destroyed by. Jake Ellenberg, got destroyed by. Tarek Safadine, he had a hard time with. That's probably the most comparable fight. Not that Gastelum is Tarek Safadine, but I think that that kind of he has that kind of speed. I mean, the only hope, I guess, is that. You know, Marquardt has a win over Tyron Woodley. Well, Gastelum lost to Woodley, but I think we've established that Gastelum versus Woodley is not an accurate bearing on either fighter's skill because of how how many uh, 
detracting factors there were coming into the fight. So anyways, Gastel by decision. Uh, Gilbert Melendez, Eddie, Eddie Alvarez. I have gone over this fight so many times in my head because it's a, it's a fight that's been rumored to happen at, at, at nauseum in, in various promotions, be it Dream, Strike Force, the UFC. I think there were talks about it late in Pride. And there were talks about it in Boda. <laughs> like it's, it is, tr it is, it is like the ultimate dream fight that hasn't really happened. Um, and now we're having it happen a bit too late. Um, <laughs> on the feet, I still give the edge to Alvarez. I think you look at Melendez striking against Pettis, against Diego Sanchez, and so on. And you see flaws. You, you, you really do. Defensively, he's, he's not great. Um, offensively, it's really high volume, and I don't think that kind of thing is going to trouble Alvarez to the same extent that a Donald Cerrone, for example, did. Um, Al Melendez has a good chin. Alvarez has a good chin. Uh, Alvarez definitely has the power advantage. Melendez is probably the better grappler of the two because Alvarez's grappling has been a little suspect in the past. Um, I mean, the, the, the hope for Melendez here is that he can replicate to a certain extent the Michael Chandler game plan that beat uh, Alvarez, which was the constant pressure, the threat of the takedown, but mixing in good striking. And that that is Melendez 101. Um, how good is he at it at this point? He had some success with Anthony Pettis, but I think we're starting to find that Pettis isn't particularly the greatest at handling pressure, really. Um, looking at the fight with Dos Anjos, and that's not to take away from Dos Anjos. He came up with a beautiful game plan to take the title, but um, if we look at the career of Anthony Pettis, he has wins over fighters that 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 pressured him, but it, it's almost always about like athletic ability advantages, um, and people who have put pressure on him, like the Bart Palaszewskis, Clay Guida, Rafa Dos Anjos, they they all beat him, and that's not a killer's row of fighters, really. I mean, maybe we'll see Dos Anjos is one, but I mean Palaszewskis wind up retired not tremendously long after his win over. Pettis and Guida faded into obscurity in the lightweight division. Is kind of having a 145 renaissance, but that's about it. Um, but enough about Anthony Pettis, because he's not fighting on this card. Um, I'm going to give the slight edge to Melendez, but it would not surprise me if Alvarez won this fight. This is a bit of a do-or-die for both of them. Um, not that they're going to get caught off of this, because they, they shouldn't. Um, and like I said, they, they won't, because John Fitz, Jake Shields, anyone. Um... That being said, I mean we're looking at uh, we're looking at two fighters who are, are who are still definitely top ten fighters, um, but they're both guys who, when they signed with the UFC, definitely had some title aspirations, and a loss here would, I think, would permanently derail that. So the, they're both in a bit of a must win. Uh, Fabrizio Verdun versus Cain Velasquez. Um, there's a lot of factors in here that makes you doubt Cain Velasquez to a certain extent. Um, one is that, okay, if we look at Fabricio's for Doom's career, when we, when people, when he, when he's fighting as the underdog, he's almost at his most dangerous. Um, he's a very smart fighter, very crafty fighter. People doubted him against Travis Brown. People doubted him against Roy Nelson, of all people. People doubted, doubted him against Fedor. People doubted him against Bigfoot Silva. People doubted him against... Under Arlovski, and that wound up being a loss, but still, people doubted him against Alexander Emelianenko. Um, this is a guy who rises to a challenge, it really, really does. Also, going against Cain Velasquez is the fact that Velasquez has got some definitive ring rust. We're talking about a guy who has not fought due to injury in over a year, and that's the key. Is I'm not a big believer in ring rust simply from being time away from the cage. I'm a Big believer in when your routine gets horrendously disrupted. What I mean by that is that Cain Velasquez trains at AKA, a notoriously hard training gym. Notorious. For borderline overworking their fighters. Um, and he's been out with a number of injuries since 2013 from the cage. Um, he's had some fights booked in that time that he is trained for, I'm sure. Sorry, I got a little hair in my eye. Um... But for a guy like him and like a lot of the AKA guys, uh, to be honest, 
injuries have really been hard to come back from at 100% because they're so used to this high work rate that it's such a change for them. It's not necessarily the ring rust, it's the fact that they haven't been doing their balls out training like they usually do. So, if you take that factor away, I probably would like Velasquez. The, the wrestling advantage I think he has, I guess stand-up's good enough, and he hasn't been submitted from the bottom ever, obviously. Um, you know, un, undefeated minus uh, one loss to Junior Dos Santos. The other thing is that Kane coming off of injuries has historically looked quite poor. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the upset here. I'm going to surprise a lot of people. I'm going to go with Fabricio Verdum to win by TKO in surprising fashion. <laughs> um, no, you know, it, it, in all seriousness, this is just going on for the Velasquez ha, has never come off of an injury well. Um, you look at his loss to Junior Dos Santos as a, a perfect example um, you look at his fight against uh, so that's really the only tremendous and he also had a year break between the Brad Morris and Jeremiah Constance fights which for those who are familiar with his, with the Bodog and Strike Force edition of Cain Velasquez you know the the one fight he had in both those organizations before getting the call to UFC. Um, Brad Morris gave... He ran over Brad Morris, but Brad Morris is not a good fighter. And that's the only time he's come back from a year layoff and done well. Fabrizio Verdum is not Brad Morris. I've got to go with Verdum to show off his ever-improving striking, his incredibly good ground skills, and to basically kind of do what he did to Fedor to a certain extent. And knock off a world number one fighter. It's not a foreign concept to him. He can do this. Um, those are my fights on the card. This went actually 17 minutes, so no real talk about the Reebok one. If, if, if you really want my opinion on the Reebok thing, I'll do a separate video on it. Um, put it that way. Anyways, have a good time.